Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to This is Revolution Podcast. For all the returning listeners and subscribers, thank you guys for coming back. To those of you new to the channel, thank you for taking a moment to check us out. If you dig what we're doing, please hit the like and, of course, the subscribe. That goes a long way in promoting what we do here. MT will not be with us for the main show this evening, but she will be joining me for the Champagne Room. Uh, our guest tonight also won't be joining us for the Champagne Room. It is definitely very late where he is on the East Coast. And I want to dive right in to the topic at hand. For those of you tuning in, I'm sure you're like, who the hell is Nellie Stone Johnson? Who, what is a Nellie Stone Johnson? We just see a picture of an old black lady, Jason. Who is said old black lady? She is a regional figure that isn't that well-known in civil rights lore, but her story is an important one that we shouldn't forget. One that should be elevated in the lexicon of leftist, feminist, and civil rights lore. Coming from humble beginnings on a small farm in Minnesota, her father was an organizer of multiracial independent farms in the early days before the Second World War, and Nellie was passing out and organizing, passing out flyers, sorry, and organizing in her teens from Paul's Peace in 1945, she became the first black elected official in Minneapolis when she won a seat on the Liberty Board by 20,000 votes. She would serve for six years, but eventually left because she wanted to devote her full energies to on the ground organizing. Her accounts convey a strong sense of how important the leadership of black trade unionists was for the entire civil rights movement in the mid 20th century. For Johnson, black labor was, quote, so far ahead of the black community, it wasn't even funny. Unquote. Despite the fact that Minneapolis's black population was small, Nellie was able to join a cohort of skilled black trade unionists who fought to bring a working class flavor to the local civil rights movement. One ally was Albert L. Allen Jr., organizer and president of Local 3015 of the Clerical Workers Union in the Minneapolis airport. He also served as president of the Minneapolis NAACP from 1946 to 1949, and as a member of the Minneapolis Fair Employment Practices Committee in the early 1950s. Cecil E. Newman, a former Pullman porter, also worked closely with Nellie. He started the Minneapolis Spokesman in 1934 and used it as a platform to promote labor unions and the New Deal while also criticizing the black elite. Nellie attended the 1949 NAACP convention where labor activists pushed more middle-class elements, including Thurgood Marshall, to start taking up a legal segregation cause similar to what would eventually become Brown v. Board of Education. According to Nellie, about a third of the convention was longshore or labor people who were more radical. Often she would class with middle class forces within the civil rights movement, which fostered a lifelong distrust. Quote, the middle class wants to slow things down too much, and they're not the ones paying the price. Plus, the middle class people came to fear labor. Unquote. In 1955, the fair employment legislation that Nellie helped pass in Minneapolis became law across the state. In 1960, a fair housing bill which she got the Central Label Council to endorse, also passed. By 1963, she was already 58 years old and had given decades to political activism. She opened her own small sewing shop, but stayed on her union's executive board and the Central Labor Council. That is from Paul's piece. Who is Nellie Stone Johnson? Actually, I think it's called something different. That's what I titled the show. <laughs> Please welcome the Sometimes Why of TDIR, and we call him the Sometimes Why, but he keeps his job. Please welcome Paul Prescott. <laughs> Paul! Great to be here, as always. Um, as long as you keep me away from Finkelstein, I'll keep my job. That's, <laughs> that's the deal. I, I, I feel like... Okay, I agree with that. That's fair. But we're crossing some some boundaries here in ridiculousness in the post Finkelstein world. He's officially gotten too big. Katie Halper has stolen him from us. Yeah, he's every time I like 
go on yeah. YouTube. He's like on three things at the same time somehow. Oh yeah, and you know Katie and and Brianna are friends, so they they're pa- they're passing him around like some sort of old lefty joint, and that's and that's just what it is. No, we do not think of you as a piece of meat. On TIR, you are a full <laughs> human being. <laughs> You can say whatever fucked up shit you want to. Yeah. I maybe maybe that's why we'll have him back because he can come on here and literally say whatever the fuck he wants. Because I looked at right before we went on, I looked at the you know top like which things are doing well, and the gooning clip is still in the top ten. I'm baffled by why that is such a big deal for people, but yeah. yeah. Um. But back to the matter at hand, which, you know, this is actually a very serious show. Um, reading your piece, I was like, why have I never heard of this woman? Right. I've watched <laughs> Eyes on the Prize 47 times. Like, seriously. Right. How did you first find out about Nellie Stone Johnson? Was this something that was assigned to you, or did you know about it beforehand? No, you know, and it's funny, I, I actually can't remember the first moment Um it was somewhere in my reading, and this actually happened, uh, I think, a couple of years ago. I wrote a piece about Maida Springer, um, mm-hmm. who was with the Ladies Garment Workers Union, a very similar kind of story, um, became a union activist, all of that stuff. And it was kind of like, a, you know, reading history and, you know, civil rights and labor. And this name just kind of keeps coming up repeatedly. And it's at some point, I just said to myself, I, I got to, like, really find out who was this person, you know, this Black woman union activist, part of the um, Minnesota Soda, uh, Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Um, so it's kind of just random. And, you know, I think her and this other person, Maida Springer, you know, they're really part of that cohort, kind of pre what we think of civil rights movement yeah. in the 50s and 60s. And during a kind of an all too brief moment of, you know, I don't know where we want to periodize it, but late thirties through, I mean, really only until the late forties, um, this cohort of black activists who were really rooted in trade unions. That was kind of the base of their activity. And that was how they understood civil rights through employment and unions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that cohort, I mean, they really did lay the groundwork for what we would later think of as the civil rights movement. Um, so she was kind of part of that cohort that's easily forgotten. Um, you know, I think someone like A. Philip Randolph, he's a little bit more remembered, even though he's part of that older generation, um, just because he stayed prominent throughout the 60s. Um, but, you know, Nellie Stone Johnson is kind of in that in that period. That's, I think, maybe the brightest period in U.S. left history and in civil rights history, but it's not really what we talk about a lot. No. I mean, again, I think when we think of Brown v. Board, I think most people think it was like a court case, like a Grisham novel, like it happened in a, in a year. And uh, as as you talk about in the piece, I mean, you just kind of mentioned it briefly, but the groundwork for Brown v. Board was laid in the 40s. You know, they really started right. trying to you know figure that out, like we're going to win through the courts, you know, was a strategy that, that took years for them to finally get that that victory. Um it, it it feels like there's some older black female activists that got a kind of a bump in the 2000s. I feel like a lot of people were talking about Ella Baker a little bit. Right. But still, what is it about the 30s and 40s and, and 20s even where it, A. Philip Randolph is still a, a name you don't hear too much? We, we got the Rustin movie. Right. Um, but that's still, you know, a part of that, you know, glory years, I guess, of civil rights. You say the the March on Washington years. Right. Uh, what What is it about, you know, in your opinion, why you think these people are so left out of the lore? Yeah, I mean, it just it doesn't gel with the story we're told today about race and civil rights. Um, and I, I know I've said this probably ten times on the show. And I, I often say it about A. Philip Randolph and Byard Rustin, but I think it would also apply to Nellie Stone Johnson and Maida Springer. I mean, if you were to take quotes of theirs and, you know, show it to a leftist today without saying who said it, mm-hmm. um, they would probably guess like, oh, man, this is some like white Bernie bro classic. 
<laughs> and, it, and I love, I mean, I put in this piece a lot of her quotes because I yeah. just love how clear and simple she's putting these things um, mm. in what I think many people would call a class reduction this way unfairly. Um, and also, I mean, what I really wanted to highlight here, and again, so many parallels with Maida Springer, um, how important they saw the New Deal. You know, it was like, again, I think these people who actually lived through it would be really shocked to learn that the New Deal was was only racist. Um, but, you know, it was actually, you know, they saw it as fundamentally important opportunity. Um, I think they recognized the limits, but they realized the reforms that were being won. Um, you know, she Nellie Stone talks about in this piece how um, she really saw the fair employment practices, which was something... A. Philip Randolph had helped yeah. to win, and she was part of that cohort that fought for and won fair employment in the defense industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she understood that they fought for it, but they also realized that Roosevelt, that was the opportunity to consolidate that. Um, and, you know, Byron Rustin called this first March on Washington movement, which is in, I think some people know the story, you know, 1941, Randolph threatens to march tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, no one really knew um, of Black people on D.C. to get fair employment and defense industry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just he threatened it. He actually was doing um, rallies across the country in some major cities and showing he could turn out, you know, like five, 10, 15,000 working class Black people. And that threat forced Roosevelt to sign an executive order. Um, that was that, you know, that was a really big deal at this time and mm -hmm. and you know that was actually when randolph i would argue was at the peak of his popularity and power and again for this very brief moment in the 40s i mean if you read what civil rights activists were saying at that time like they were viewing civil rights almost exclusively through the lens of labor and full employment and fair employment um you know but they recognized the new deal as part of that structure that made this um, possible. And I think Byron Rustin called that first March on Washington movement of 41, um, the inaugural event of the civil rights movement. Um, which I think is a good way to put it. And that was where the first idea of a March on Washington even started. Um, but again, all this stuff flies in the face of like what we're told today that, you know, all black people hated the new deal. They got nothing out of it. They all got hated nothing it. out of it. Yeah. They all hated it. And, you know. Does that does that feel like a liberal talking point to you? Because I I saw a clip that went viral, and it's an old clip of uh, John Stewart. I can't remember who he was talking to. I think he was talking to some right winger, and he was trying to talk about kind of the evils of, of racism and black people in the country, and how this person should understand, you know, why Negroes are angry about something. I can't, you know, I don't know the time frame of when the clip was originally cut because Stewart hasn't had a show and been that popular for over a decade, right? Um, he, he said the same thing. He said the new deal didn't help black people. And he was, you know, <clears throat> someone else on the panel, he was on echo that same sentiment. And I just kind of shook my head. I was like, oh. and I think at least from what I've heard, I think the conservative take is more so it didn't help because it created the welfare dependency. Mm. Um, but they, even that is a different argument because at least they are acknowledging that the programs were black people did have some access to these programs. Um, but I think it's like, but I think in the liberal mind today, I don't think, I actually don't even think it was always this way, but it's, mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I think it's totally fair to point out. Yeah. There, there was some discrimination. There was definitely, oh, definitely. you know, that that's totally fair, mm -hmm. but the way it's talked about is not in any sort of nuanced way. And again, I mean, someone has to explain to me why, the vast majority of black voters switched from the Republican Party, a.k.a. the party of Lincoln, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. the party that ended slavery. Why shift so dramatically at that very specific point of the New Deal? So they had to be getting something out of this. They had to understand that it was aligned with their interests to some degree, even if they knew it had its limits. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just like really lazy history. Um but yeah, if you if you have that mindset, then like someone like Nellie Stone Johnson just like doesn't make sense. Like why why would this woman, a black woman in the 30s, be so pro union? I mean, every quote out of her mouth is about how labor is the most important thing for black mm -hmm. people, you know. But that that can't compute if you have this other view of the history. 
Um, how do you think her leftist upbringing helped her form her politics? We often talk about people um, in the political arena like Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg uh, being the children of Marxists. Does it make a difference when your parents are from the working class and on the ground organizers and not academics? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the fact that her father, so, you know, she has a rural upbringing in mm -hmm. Minneapolis. Um, and I think there's a few things going on. One of them is like, she didn't, she didn't feel the kind of brunt of racism as much until she moved into the city. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was a rural upbringing. Her father was involved in a nonpartisan league, which was like started by a socialist party person. Um, they were basically campaigning on like rural issue issues, nationalization of certain things. Um, they were campaigning against, you know, unfair pricing of, of products. Um, and she does go into like her father who, who was black, you know, but had to organize interracially. And it kind of just wasn't even a big deal for them. It's just what it what it was and what they did. Um, so I think just that first common sense understanding of building an interracial movement around around class interests. But yeah, I I suspect like not having an academic parent <laughs> would help. Um, and I think the way she's learning these lessons isn't academically; it's through the organizing. Um, and you know, she the the Minnesota um, Farmer Labor Party. I mean, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. I mean, one could argue the most successful third party effort in the country. Um, you know, this, it starts out as a farmer party, they get more involved in labor. Um, and they run, you know, they actually run their own candidates, they get a lot of people elected, even the governor of Minnesota, at one point, is, um, you know, a, a farmer labor party candidate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, getting involved in that kind of independent politics um she's involved in they merge with the democratic party um kind of this fusion a little bit like a fusion voting system um and she was an advocate of that merger and again as she explains it at the time in 1944 that was because she saw it as very important a re-electing roosevelt and consolidating the gains of the new deal but there were debates within the organization um around that but you know by the time she moves to the city you know, the former Labor Party has a, a labor core. I think it's also interesting, you know, 1934 was a historic year for labor. You have three general strikes led by radicals. You know, you have the West Coast Longshore people, you have um, Toledo, Ohio, Auto Parts. And then in Minneapolis, you have the famous 1934 Teamster strike. Um, so she kind of was witnessing, and these were, you know, huge battles with the police. Um, her father helped organized food, you know, for the striking workers. That was a huge battle, a huge victory that year for the Teamsters. Um, so, you know, I think all of this is just like in the in the air as she's developing. Um, you know, another striking thing, I mean, you see all these parallels. Again, I keep bringing up this woman, Maida Springer, mm -hmm. as the parallels, but like, you know, in both of their families, they had close family members, family friends who were Pullman porters, who mm -hmm. were and that was one of the first experiences really of black trade unionism, but, you know, porters that kind of coached them on unions and they saw the benefit of unions. Um, so I think it's just all these kind of influences in the same pot, um, you know, that, that led her to, to come out this way. Um, but um, it, it's definitely the, the, the context. And again, in the forties, this idea of fair employment and full employment was like central. Um, and, you know, she fought to pass, a basically a citywide version of the Fair Employment Practices Act. Um, and then they, they made it state statewide and also with fair housing. Um, but, you know, she she's very clear that like black labor was kind of always ahead, always at the forefront of the broader civil rights movement. I mean, fair housing before the Fair Housing Act. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. the Fair Housing Act is 60, 68, I believe. Uh, 60 or, what was 65 Civil Rights Act? 65 was voting rights, 64 voting rights, right. civil rights, and then I think 68 was housing. Um, oh, wow. So three years before, uh, before, no, eight years before, 1960? Well, they passed it, I think, in Minnesota. It was in the 50s. Um, Jeez. But, um, you know, another interesting thing during this period, I mean, I would love at some point to write a piece about this, but an interesting phenomenon during the 30s and 40s, a little bit in the 50s, is these trade unionists, 
from mostly the CIO unions, black trade unionists, essentially like taking over NAACP chapters and making them more, more radical and more working class. And it happened mm -hmm. a lot of places. It happened in Chicago with um, you know, packing house workers, in Detroit, auto workers basically took over that NAACP, made it more focused on jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you see this dynamic with Nelly in, in Minnesota. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, plenty of other places, but um, yeah, again, it's just giving this working class flavor to the organization during that period where unions were really, um, really ascendant. Um, it seems like Nellie Johnson was forward thinking about civil rights for black people and also equality for women. Uh, again, why is she a forgotten figure and we don't look at her as a proto intersectionalist uh when it comes to her activism yeah i mean again interesting you know she was like the one of the first women i think the first woman on her union's bargaining committee she was eventually vice president she fought to form um the local chapter of the coalition of labor union women or clue um which is a group that still exists to this day in many cities um but again i mean as you see in some of the quotes it's she really saw even the issue of women's rights very centered in labor. And she mm -hmm. kind of always came back to like, labor is the start of everything. You know, having a good job is really what allows everything else to flower after that. Um, I, I didn't I didn't put that quote in. I, I was very quote close to putting the, the end quote in where she's like, if it wasn't for advances in the labor movement, you wouldn't have been able to go to these, you know, Right. fancy schools was she looked at as kind of an old person that didn't want to get with this new kind of postmodernist take on women and the family and things like that do you think yeah i think so and like you know one of her quotes i could see it maybe being interpreted as like an a really as an outdated view of looking um i don't have the exact quote on my head but she's basically yeah. saying like well i mean a lot of women benefited from a man that could have one job and support yeah. a family and that trickle down of that could support more educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, someone maybe could interpret that as she's saying like, yeah, woman should just stay at home. I mean, I highly doubt that again, her <laughs> own life, she was working her own life, her whole life. But, um, um, again, I think it's a different mode of thinking about, you know, I don't, I don't see, she, she ever got into the place of thinking about, yeah, how can more women get, into corporate boardrooms? How can there be more women, small business owners? Even though Nelly actually eventually, she owned a small business herself. Um, but yeah, she kind of just never changed, which I think is a good thing in this context. Um, but, you know, as the years go on, you know, and like both the Democratic Party and the civil rights movement and groups like the NAACP are drifting from this kind of class focused vision. Mm -hmm. She's kind of just really staying the course on that um and she's just very clear that as labor is going down you're seeing you know the conditions of black people broadly going down and, and you know i think that's very very true um and it is a very weird dynamic i'm of course not saying like oh things were great in the 1940s but even statistically um the 1940s was actually one of the best decades for black workers and one of the decades where the gap between white and black workers was actually narrowing at its most was the 1940s and again people are probably shocked i mean you think well why isn't the 60s but again what's happening there you have the essentially a full employment economy uh, mm -hmm. fueled by the war and you have like the peak of union power um that made the 1940s actually like a very important decade for black workers um and I, you know if you, were to, if you were to look strictly at economics you could even argue maybe that was a better decade than this decade has been for black workers broadly. Is that just the expansion of the war machine and, and factory work? And then post-World War II kind of, you know, what are we going to do with all these factories? Make yeah. Stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's sad. Yeah. It's definitely a part of it. And like, um, I mean, this is partly what Rustin was talking about um, was like, we kind of show during the war, what's possible like yeah we just employ people and we don't ask people to be educated first or to be trained first we're just like we're going to give you a job and you're going to do it 
Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea was like, how do you do this during peacetime? And their his idea was the freedom budget. Um, I mean, Walter Ruther from the the former auto workers president, he also had ideas around post-war conversion. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, those ideas in, intersected with, you know, shortening the work week and a work day to allow for full employment. Um, but yeah, that, that was the question of like, can we do this during peacetime? Like we shouldn't have to be doing this just for a war. Um, but it is a reality that the war, you know, um, kind of led to that full employment situation and, and opened up. I mean, that was the occasion for Randolph to do this march for jobs. It was specifically about the, the defense industry because, you know, the jobs are coming, black workers aren't getting it, you know, let's, you know, have it be fair, fair employment. Um, will we see any more Nellie Johnson's? I hope, again, I mean, it's like, it's almost like an alien. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Again, I'm reading the quotes. I just love reading it because it's like a totally different framework for understanding everything. Um, and yeah, and again, it's interesting what figures. And I, I mean, I have nothing against Ella Baker being lifted up. Actually, you see the picture in the back is yeah. Ava Randolph and Ella Baker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but um, and I, and she, of course, herself had an appreciation of labor, and she actually worked. For the NWACP in the years where there was heavy trade union influence in the 40s. Um, but I think that's because that's not what defines her. She's getting, you know, she's gotten a little bit more attention. Um, I mean, I, you know, my one, I guess my hope is that now I do think labor is getting sexy again. Um, I think there is a new generation really getting interested right now. You know, labor had a good year in 2023. Hopefully it continues. So, I mean, I'm, I hope that out of that, we get more people like uh, Nellie Stone Johnson. And I think there's a lot of people who already exist like that who are in unions, but maybe just are not of the left yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I think have probably very similar sentiments. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting. I don't know. What, what do they say? Tough times make tough people? I mean, <laughs> kind of, you know, growing up and. Uh, was she born like eight oh five? Yeah, yeah, great year. <laughs> That's notoriously easy year. To, uh, very different time to be alive. I, I think right. in your piece you say when she's a teen, she's riding on horseback, distributing right. flyers. Right. So, you know, we're talking about no indoor plumbing. You know, very different time. Um, you wrote another article for Jacobin. Uh, titled Identity Politics is a Poor Substitute for Socialism. I too feel like abstract fights against whiteness obfuscate class politics and too easily try to conflate race with class, allowing, if anything, PMCs of color to get larger pieces of a dwindling pie while the poor and working classes are left out. Do you concur? Yes. <laughs> Good night. Um, <laughs> it's a short show, folks. <laughs> at all. Um, yeah, well, and this piece um, was actually a re review I wrote of um, so uh, a recent book, No Politics But Class Politics. You might have had Adolf on to talk about it. Um, I think so. Yeah. But it's a collection of articles over you know the last few decades by Adolf Reed and Walter Ben Michaels, um, Anton Yeager um, edits. There are a few interviews in there. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a collection of articles that really perfectly get at um, this question of of you know um, focusing on racial disparities, on identity politics. And I think what's great about this book, it um, I think it really clearly demonstrates how identity politics and focus on eliminating racial disparities is like perfectly compatible with neoliberalism. Um, hmm. It is totally possible um, to, and it's done all the time, to address these disparities without addressing inequality, without really addressing the conditions of the vast majority of Black people. I mean, one great example is like, you know, let's think about, um, 
like a, a low paying job, low paying jobs that mm-hmm. where there are disproportionately black workers, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a perfect. Fast food. Yeah. Let's name that whatever. Yeah, you need. yeah. But you know, the, it's a perfect like dichotomy of like this disparitarian the disparities approach. Mm-hmm. The idea would just be like, well, let's make sure that the correct percentage of these shitty jobs are held by white guys. Whereas what we should as social should be thinking is like, no, like let's make these jobs good jobs. Just mm-hmm. like, you know, um, working in an auto factory used to be an absolutely horrible job mm-hmm. and they unionized and made it a good job. And then it has become a bad job again, but they're working on that now. Mm-hmm. But, um, and it's also, I mean, in a way it's a very elitist view of like, the idea is like, well, we need to get people out of these jobs. Like, they, we need to make them upwardly mobile to become middle class. And I guess the dream is one day every single human being will somehow be middle class. Where it's like, no, there's nothing wrong with the job per se. We obviously need these jobs. We need people doing them. But we want to make these good jobs. Um, whether they're held by mostly black people or white people, we want to make these good paying jobs. Um, so, I mean, things like that. I mean, same thing with education. I mean, it's like, are we going to fight forever over the percentage of black students in Ivy Leagues, or are we going to make college tuition free, which of course would benefit the vast but, majority of but is, yeah. Isn't, isn't that what happened though with the Supreme Court decision? Right. I mean, a, a friend of show, my, my good friend in real life, uh, Bert Cooper wrote, I think a great piece in the Atlantic, um, you know, regardless of the decision, nothing changed for, for poor and working class uh, people of color. Right. And, and, it's not like they're talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you know what I mean? And it feels like a lot of these things that are discussed in that arena really sit in like PMC and academic circles. Right. And if you get outside of these shows and actually hang around real working people, no one's going to know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and and again it's totally possible to address these disparities. Mm-hmm. without really fighting capitalism at all. And I think it's missing the diagnosis. Like these these disparities in the first place were not necessarily caused by racism alone. And I don't think they can be addressed by race alone. Um, well, you know, so many they'll things, tell you reparations, right? That's, that's what they'll tell you. They'll well, yeah. Like, Aha. But so many <laughs> of these things, you know, if, if we're dealing with structural economic factors such as mechanization of agriculture, such as movement of factories to the suburbs and overseas such as automation all this stuff like that's not a purely race race is not purely driving that so i think uh, trying to address it through the lens of racial disparities is not ever going to get at it um get get at the real issue um and yeah it is very disconnected i think from what most people are actually uh think thinking about um on a deal and i think there's a lot of uh ventriloquism of like this is the black issue but it's like well it's a maybe an issue for a segment of of black people but um you know i think it turns out many people are thinking about similar things about their job you know their their housing their their public schools it's public schools that are turning into charter schools that aren't making money so charter schools are getting you were you were an educator for some time you know charter schools are closed I substituted in charters before I, because they didn't require um, yeah. certification. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a nightmare. Um, you know, these are the things I think that are dominating the people's daily lives. Um, and yeah, again, it, it, I think purely looking at in disparities, like you can solve the disparity actually, and like that still leaves most people out of the equation. Um, it, but also, too, I mean, that's I feel like once you start having the conversation that goes beyond, um, well, we just need to have what we think these people have. And then, you know, the darities of the world or the derivatives of the darities of the world, you know, jump in there and say, well, white wealth, black wealth, and then it becomes the income disparity conversation which I've always been like, well, I don't understand what you're talking about because you're acting as if collectively all black people hang out and share money 
like it's some friends helping friends right. money pyramid from the mid 90s so being that that's not how it works like i've never been able to ask will smith if he could loan me some money to you know will smith i need a new ring light <laughs> and i i just just let me hold something till the first see that you gotta know who to ask okay i don't know the right you hit up cat williams <laughs> he, he, he will give you what you need uh, <laughs> Cat Williams, side note, is become probably the most popular person on the internet, all because he just started gossiping. I know it's it's so funny. It's just like pure, pure hater shit. Uh, it, it, dude, dude, so I spent all of today because Tucson said people are asking you to release the Cat Williams show. And instead of releasing the whole two and a half hour show, I cut it about an hour and some change clip. And Cat Williams just says the most, you're like, come on, dude. Yeah. Harvey Weinstein is trying to blow him. It's just, it's too much. But he's like, he, and now like there's yeah. 10,000 people who are now have their own react, have their own reaction videos. I'm like, did he really say it? And I, I'm almost ashamed to admit Maybe I shouldn't be ashamed. I watched the whole fucking thing, all right? I did. Yeah, I did. You have to watch the whole thing. And yeah, it was entertaining, but like I don't I don't see what the like bonanza is about um fully. I mean, did he really say anything that shocking? I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, he has beef. Okay. Fine. The the, th the thing is what Cat Williams did, in my opinion, is the same thing you see in disparity discourse. All I have to do is yell some stuff out. Right. And it's not necessarily false, but your lived experience makes it the capital T truth. And by the time someone tries to come in and, and iron out all of the craziness and what you said, you don't care anyway. Yeah. Because Cat Williams goes, look, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just telling like it is. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel with the spirit. I mean, the numbers are there. You can use the Google machine, as as you know, us old people now say. I'm old, so I'm gonna start talking like an old person. Um, and find out, oh, it looks like Darity's right about but right. then again, no one asked the question, like, okay, you're speaking about this like it's shared money. So do you think, you know, to Adolf Reed's quote, which I thought kind of should have eliminated that whole discourse, right. you know. Yeah. Can the waitress that's facing eviction text Elon Musk for a loan so she can stay in her right. fucking house, the white waitress? It's like, no, no. And again, and what is actually causing the disparity in the first place, you know, is not explored. And, and you know, what's funny too, I mean, even if you want to go down the route of like wealth, mm -hmm. guess what? The wealth gap is much lower among black, comparing black union members to white, you know, mm -hmm workers um home ownership much higher among black union members again it's not rocket science unions get you more fucking money i mean um so even yeah, if, UPS. If, if, <laughs> yeah. and some unions you know i will you know my fiance she's in afge the federal workers union she works for the va um i mean thanks to her, her union is how we got our house like they oh we got a realtor we got a lender mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so yeah, even if you do want to play this game of the wealth gap, I mean, again, guess what has been the most effective for eliminating that? Turns out is unions. I mean, um, and yeah, I think I think the figures show when we've seen the lowest wealth gaps, I think the biggest periods have been the New Deal period and even the Great Society period, which even itself was limited. But even that, yeah. you know, social programs help to... Uh, limit that um but yeah it's just a very but yeah i think the power in the discussion is that because again it's not you can't actually statistically deny disparities don't look at the chat jason don't. i can't do it <laughs> um yeah you, you should marry yourself a union bro <laughs> let's see them federal workers uh, <laughs> Oh, my. um 
that's my life advice. I'm not big. <laughs> like, they out here treating you like you just you writing uh, on a blog. Like you just like you just sit here blogging. I, maybe I should start like a union dating app. There probably is one already. But um, a union dating app that sounds like a nightmare. Don't do that. Or paradise. <laughs> um what was i even saying uh you said marry him with yeah, a good government that. job that's what you said i stand by that but what was i saying before that <laughs> the less important thing i was saying <laughs> saying before that um <laughs> Oh man, I shouldn't have I can't, I can't. You started it. Know, you fucking started it. You are the most serious person that ever comes on this show. This is a show where Derek Varn, who is serious whenever he's on the show, gets on here and he can't even be serious. Mm-hmm. He's finally broken you. It, it, it not, on the free show, on the free show, you do let loose yeah, yeah, behind right, the paywall. Right, right. But on the free show, this is this is. Because you saw that shit too, and it was a leftist polyamorous dating site. So I can't. Um, <laughs> yeah, now that we've totally lost, we uh, totally <laughs> lost our, our train of thought. Um, I'm sorry I mentioned Cat Williams. It wasn't on any of the things that I, I, I mentioned too. I brought it up. That's when you, that's the problem. When you, when you say that, it's. It, the numbers jumped up of who was watching. Like all of a sudden, it's like the internet said, "Excuse me." <laughs> like a Cat Williams that signal. It's trending when Joe <laughs> Rogan has to talk about Cat Williams. Mm. Joe Rogan doesn't know black people exist outside of Dave Chappelle. It's probably true. And when he has to talk about Cat Williams, this dude took the internet by storm. By li- and I said it on the clip that that I cut that'll come out tomorrow morning. I was like, he just did the Donald Trump thing. If I just say outlandish shit, right? I come on the internet, you like Eddie Murphy said, I can't give a curse show. Oh, Eddie, in 2024, you can. Filth, flour, and flour, and filth. Right. <laughs> That's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, we, we love the gossip. We fucking but, love the gossip. But what I was saying, um, yeah, I, I think <laughs> going, I think why the disparities discord, why it has power is because Again, even I, even Adolf, it's not that you can deny the disparities. I mean, the numbers are there. So I think that in itself gives it so much power because it's like, look, we're seeing, we see the disparities right here. It's in number. But again, that doesn't help explain the causal relationship. Can, can we address this real quick? I just, I just want to address this real quick because this is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. This person right here, I feel like it's like a white guy. Uh-huh. I feel like it's because only a white guy would say something this stupid. First of all, who the fuck is taking a cab in 2024? There's a reason why multiple cab drivers have literally committed suicide on the steps of the Capitol. Because no one takes cabs. Who the hell are you in your time machine? Going back into time when black people are trying to hail fucking cabs in New York City. And don't get on here and send a comment. I'm a black man and I take go. F- <laughs> Shut up. You use Uber and Lyft like everybody else. I'm not going to lie. In Philly, when I to Philly airport, I take, yeah. I take a regular yeah. cab. Is it cheaper? And I do notice when I'm not wearing a suit. It's <laughs> <which is> always... <laughs> I haven't been in a cab and I live in a pl- in my city Uber and Lyft are illegal. Oh shit. There's no Uber and Lyft. So your dream came true. You got you got talked about on the main show. You said something extremely retarded. Thinking that this dude is out here with a briefcase and an afro and a gold chain on going, I don't know why the white man won't pick me up. I try, I fight, I try to fight. Yeah. Nigga, please. <laughs> the motherfuckers is ordering Ubers left and right all over the goddamn nation. And you over here talking about 
catching a cab. And then this and Paul is such a fucking coon. You think he's sitting there going, well, it must be because <laughs> he he didn't seize me, man. Just face it. You suck. You suck. You suck. And, you know, I will fill time telling people you suck because there's nothing you can do about it. Because that will get you 500,000 views, probably. Oh, no, because I'm not Norm Finkelstein. If I was like, and then this this Guna, he's a Guna. Did you? I, I don't think you realize this, Jason. Hmm. Sorry for the audience. This is inside baseball. I sent you a clip. My brother does the most hilarious Finkelstein impression. And I think I sent you a clip. I, one. Me, so I haven't seen it yet. You didn't listen to it. You got I haven't it. listened to it yet. If you can <laughs> you find did, that. I saw you send me something. If you can, oh my God, it is the the best, the best thing you will ever listen to. I, I want, I want to hear it now. Me and your brother have to have a Finkelstein impersonation off. And Andy Williams says uh, that black people not catching a cab died with Uber. LOL. Andy Williams lives in New York City. Hmm. I've walked all over New York with Andy Williams, and you know what we didn't do? We didn't go. Ah. <laughs> 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 you know, we we did like we do what everybody else does in tw- in in the new fucking rideshare millennium. We all pulled our phones out and we went, "How are we gonna get to the fucking bar after this live show? And who's gonna call the Uber?" That's what we did. You know why we did that? Because that's what everybody does. God, if you're going to try to insult somebody, now I gotta talk to you like Cat Williams. Don't come at the king. You tried to come for the king. It's funny you mentioned that because I walked from <laughs> California to Maine. You just said ridiculous. Is I read five thousand books <laughs> for a week, <laughs> and nobody could stop me. <laughs> I was homeless at twelve years old, but I still made a million dollars a day washing cars. Like, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> I stole stereos out of cars in Miami, Florida. When the cocaine cowboys was killing everybody, you just did that? Nobody had a problem with it? <laughs> okay. I'm going to start making up my origin story and just make my origin story trays from Boys in the Hood. <laughs> my mama sent me to live with my daddy when I was 12. A nigga broke in the house and my daddy shot at him. And then a black police officer made me angry and I punched the air in front of my gorgeous girlfriend, Nia Long. Nia Long was a federal worker on, on this planet. <laughs> Let's just start making up all kind of rules. But that, find yourself, you know Steve Harvey worked for the VA. Find yourself a unionized federal worker, Nia Long. That's, what, that's what we're after. Ooh. Nia, dude, Tucson broke my heart when she told me, first of all, I would never, ever be able to date Nia <laughs> I mean, you, come on. You didn't already know this? Like, I, I live close enough to Southern California that maybe kind of on accident. I can, I've can. i been in the yeah, same the room. The population is so little that she's bound to, to run into you in Southern California. I have been in some rooms with some very attractive Celebritize. There is a possibility. Did not know your name and did not after the encounter know your name. Sorry. You know what? You know, look. I think Nia Long is Bayesian background. I think. No, no, she's uh, she's one of you people. She's one of them island blacks. That's what I'm saying. Bayesian. Oh, you're like Haitian, Haitian, right? I said Bayesian. That's like Barbadian. Oh, Barbadian. I thought it was Haitian, but you're. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. So, if anything, I mean, I would have a better. So you said date me along. No, dude, Nia, Tucson is so mean. I was like, Tucson, can I get with Meg, Megan the Stallion, the Stallion? She was like, no, never happened. I mean, Jesus. It's, not even, it's not even like an insult. It's just like, it's just they're in a different life than us. I okay. spent so many years in these places you know, my office was next to these backstages for a long time. I still have friends in that arena that I still keep in contact with. I can just stroll to Coachella 
and accidentally on purpose run into Megan the Stallion. Oh, hey, fancy meeting you in catering. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll work. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's what you want. I think you need a woman like Nellie Stone Johnson. I do. I do. I do. Let's see. Let's see if that. Ha- let's see. If, let's see what twenty twenty four brings. Every black person that's not Paul to Jason is Haitian. That is very true. <laughs> that is the most fair. You're surrounded. Statement. The show is too Haitian centric. You know. You gotta... <sighs> it, people don't realize how many. Hey, Marcus is Jamaican. Right. He's hundred percent Jamaican. Mm-hmm. Someone says Jason got his eye on Laura Ingram. <laughs> that's that's gross, but funny. Um, what's your next piece, Paul? What are you working you on? No, I'm working on this. Has literally been like three or four years in the making. Not that I it's taken me this long the whole time, but I keep starting going back. I'm writing a piece on Adam Clayton Power, Adam Clayton Powell Jr who is like okay. a fascinating political figure. I mean, for mm-hmm. those that don't know, he was uh, Harlem's congressman, a uh, very light-skinned black man who passed for white, but you know, um, Harlem's congressperson from roughly 1946 to 1970. Um, and he, you know, his start in politics, he was a city council person a few years before that. He kind of was reared in the 30s, 40s era, Um, (laughs) pastor at Abyssinian Baptist Church, one of the oldest and most notable um, congregations in the the country. Pastor there, you know, was fighting for economic rights in the 30s, 40s, became a congressman. um, And I think his career almost perfectly traces like the transition from the New Deal era Mm -hmm. to the Black Power era and he somehow was able to embody all these tendencies at the same time but his career really follows that track you know he was he was the chair of the house labor and education committee from Mm -hmm. 1960 to 66 um so you know he became a really powerful figure championing new deal legislation but he had a lot of personal issues was a very cynical figure also um you know he wound up getting his seniority stripped um and it was kind of a sad ending for him but i think a very fascinating figure i mean he used to kind of like randolph used to be the dominant civil rights figure i mean his he used to be called mr civil rights um in his day before kind of being eclipsed by the leaders in the 60s so i've been working on this for a while but um very interesting figure and i think if you look at his career in the context of like tracing the Black politics going from the New Deal era to the Black Power era, his career kind of like perfectly traces that. Um, so yeah, that's I'm hoping I can finish this in like the next month or two months. But is this going to be for Catalyst? This is a longer extended essay that maybe you're going to do for Catalyst. Uh, no, I'm going to do it for Jacobin, but it'll probably okay. be a little longer. Um, but and it, you know, interesting enough, there. I don't know if this story would be interesting to people, but I find it interesting, so you're going to hear it. Uh, Again, 1941, the the March on Washington, the first March on Washington, after, you know, they got the win, the executive order, they kept the March on Washington movement kind of as a loose organization throughout the 1940s. And, you know, they were doing rallies in St. Louis. They had a really strong chapter. I mean, they did a lot of direct action that won victories. Um, But, you know, I kind of highlighted this activity in 1943, Randolph organized a rally in Madison Square Garden that drew, I think, around like 20,000 people. And there were rumors that Randolph was going to run for Congress. Um, And the story goes that Adam Clayton Powell used that night, again, as a massive night. I mean, it was like the event to be at. Um, He used that night to announce his run for Congress, and many people think he kind of stole it from Randolph uh, mm. that night. Um, I'm not so sure Randolph was going to run for Congress, though. Um, I think people wanted him to, but um, but that was but part of what I want to go into my piece is like Powell's rise was 
in that era, that like 1940s March in Washington era, mm -hmm. that is what Powell was a product of that era. And that's kind of what launched him to Congress. And that you kind of always have that labor and jobs understanding. Um, but also being a cynical politician, I mean, as things went towards black power, he co-opted that too. And he was straddling both worlds. I mean, there's a lot of pictures with like Sophie Carmichael, mm -hmm. Lloyd McKissick, you know, they were all kind of saw Powell as a mentor. Um, and part of what some people uh, credit Powell with the phrase black power. He actually said it before Carmichael. Um, and one of Powell's points was like, I mean, I'm already demonstrating black power. I, I'm like the chair of a major congressional committee. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting, interesting guy. Hmm. Why aren't you writing a book? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I've thought about it. I don't know. I don't know if I have the time. It's like, because you're you're actually busy doing real on the ground organizing. I do, you know, what someone I want to write about, um, Ernest Calloway, who was a black organizer with the Teamsters in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There's a great book already that touches on his life called Total Person Unionism. That's about him and Harold Gibbons in this local in St. Louis, and they pioneered a lot of great program they did like a community stewards programs where they took their union shop stewards and they would take on community issues and you know things like that um but another one of these like trade unionist figures that i mean his politics were like randolph and rustin's um but that is just like totally gone to history even though he wrote a lot i mean the archives have a lot of it he wrote for local newspapers, he wrote for Teamster publications. Um, so there's a lot you can find of his stuff that he's written. Um, but I think he was one of the most like brilliant minds of that civil rights labor era. Um, so my dream would be to like write a book about him, but I gotta go to the archives. Like, come on, I don't got time for that. Um, do you think Do you think, I don't want to say civil rights, because I feel like we're kind of beyond that, but still the identity moment that we're in right now, that's kind of dislodged from labor or is, or is labor being kind of taken over by the identity moment as well? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, one of my fears is that uh, I think it's great there is more enthusiasm about labor and that younger people are getting excited. I mean, one of my fears is that maybe people of a certain generation where they, I mean, almost just can't avoid the identity mindset and all that comes with it and are going to try to act that out in labor. Um, that is a fear of mine. I mean, I, I don't think, I wouldn't say labor is being totally taken over by that moment. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it sometimes comes out and I mean, you know, we had the same discussions in labor about like, yeah, well, what if we have more black union presidents? What if we have more woman union presidents? So, I mean, it's not like labor is immune from this kind of stuff. But I do think just by the nature of labor, it kind of tempers that stuff um, just inevitably, given what what labor is and has to be. Um, but yeah, I am curious about the new generation getting involved in labor, like how are they going to be in the labor movement? What ideas are they going to be bringing with them? Um, I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, sadly, I missed all that. My connection was lost, so I didn't hear anything you said. I will assume that it was very brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's Paul, don't worry about that. What I said, I just laid out how you can get with Neil Long. I, and we just I, missed it. <laughs> I gave every tip. Every tip. For the first thing you have to do is go to a Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles near Baldwin Hills. Yeah. That's oh, always the first step. I mean, a small handful of people got that. You know who didn't got that? Get that? The douchebag that made the hmm. comment about catching a cab in 2024. He has no idea what Baldwin Hills is. He's going to Google it right now and act like he knew, but he doesn't know. That's what makes a person awesome. That's what makes him a white guy. Mm. You're, you're a white guy. And 
And until you, you know, no, who wants to be a white guy in 2024? It's way easier to pretend you're somebody else on the internet and like not use your real name. By the way, I saw someone asking in the chat, that book I mentioned was called Fighting for Total Person Unionism. About, again, it's about Ernest Calloway and his Harold Gibbons, who was head of the teams as local in St. Louis. Um, Harold Gibbons is also very interesting. He was close with Hoffa. Um, anyway, that's that will hopefully be an article down the road. Um, but that's a great, great book. His name is Paul Prescott when he's not trying to organize labor for better working conditions and better pay. He occasionally writes an article for Jacobin magazine. Thank you so much for joining us. We were trying to do this before the year end 2023. I'm glad we got to do it in 2024 and hopefully I will talk to you. Maybe, maybe see you in April. Oh, right. And I think my goal would be before that, I'm going to finish this Adam Clayton Powell piece. So that's my, that, that's my goal. Well, Godspeed, good man. Thank you very much for taking the time to hang out with us. That is Paul Prescott. The sometimes Y member of TIR, also another island black dude. They're just everywhere on this show. There's... You know how hard it is to find a non-island black person in the East Coast? I honestly believe, I tell this to Tucson Pascal all the time, I don't believe there's just black people in, in, in New York. All of you are some sort of island mix. I refuse to believe it. Every time I, we talk about a rapper, first thing Pascal and Tucson, oh, you know he's Jamaican. Oh, you know he's Haitian. Oh, you know this person's... Tr-. Every time. Every time. That being said, I will be joined by my good Haitian friend, M. Toussaint in the Champagne Room. We'll be going there very shortly. If you like what we do here on TIR and you have the means and feel so inclined and would like to support, become a patron for as little as $3 a month or $30 for the year. You're going to have access to Champagne Rooms past and present. Join us for our call-in shows and so much more. Movie night, which is coming up soon. I have to schedule it with Jeremy Salmon. I have some movie night ideas. I do want to pass it along to you guys, you patrons, and see what you guys think. Someone was saying we were talking about our fantasy football league that we did uh, last year that Emma Viglin won. Um, they said, how can I, when, when did you guys do this? We did it for the patrons. So become a patron. Um, and we will do more fun shit. There's more fun shit coming this year. For patrons, I promise. That being said, someone says a ninja movie. We, you know what? We did. We watched Ninja Three: The Domination. There's movies you guys suggest. Like you guys, what? We watched it. Somebody said oh, Four Lions. We watched it. Movie night is a lot of fun. We watch a ton of insane movies. Willy Dynamite is still one of my favorite movie night movies we watched. Gordon from Sesame Street running down those stairs. Oh. But that being said, if you like what you saw tonight, even if you didn't, give it a like. If you like what you saw and you want to subscribe, subscribe. Those passive gestures go a long way in making sure we can continue to do this show and sometimes yell at people in the chat. (laughs) They tried to come for the king. Really? Like, you can't go, oh, he thinks, you know, I think what I want to think because you don't show yourself. So, got to remember that. When you live in the shadows, you're going to be ripe for clowning. So, we'll see you guys on the other side in the champagne room. I am out. <laughs>